What's going on, everybody? Happy Thursday. Welcome into Bet to Win here in the Blue Wire Studios inside the Win Las Vegas. I am your host, Joe Fan. Appreciate you joining us as always. Lots to discuss. Game three in the finals in the books. The Celtics take a 2 1 lead. I've got my guy, Nick Dayus, on to discuss it all here shortly. But first, got a victory lap to take. Another one. Another one. Mets money line on Monday against the Padres at plus money, plus 103. That cashes. Uh, they scored three in the first and won comfortably 11 to five on the road against the Fathers. Your boy is now 10, three, and one over my last 14 picks uh, on this show. Try to make it 11, three, and one with a winning pick at the end of this one. Uh, but it's been fun. Love cashing tickets. Thank you to the Mets. After, after they won that game on Monday, they got blown out games two and three of that series. So I got it when, they, when, it was, when they were playing well and Blake Snell predictably got smoked by the Mets. Again, Mets bat score 11 runs in that game and a comfortable win. Uh, real quickly, before we get to Nick, uh, the NBA Celtics win at home and handle the Warriors 116-100. They cover as three and a half point favorites. They now lead the series two to one. The Stars were out in force for Boston. Jalen Brown, 27, nine and five. He had 17 in the first quarter alone. Jason Tatum, 26, six and nine. Marcus Smart, 24, seven and five. In addition to standout defense from the defensive player of the year. Steph Curry was incredible. He had 31, four and two. But late in that game, suffers an injury, a foot injury. Uh, now wait and see mode, says the Warriors. He expects to play in game four on Friday, but unlikely to be anywhere near 100%. Um, Warriors were already uh, looking like they were in serious danger at plus 185 now on the series line. But if Steph is anywhere, um, they're significantly below 100%. They're going to be in trouble. They need some guys to step up. Uh, the Celtic size continues to be an issue. They had 15 offensive rebounds to the Warriors' five. Grant Williams was big in this game. And the Warriors have absolutely no answer for Robert Williams. And I, I watched a number of games in the regular season. Um, Utah comes to mind where they've got, obviously, Rudy Gobert, but they've got depth in the front court. And they dominated on the glass against the Warriors. And that was a game I remember watching and saying, that is the Dubs Achilles heel. If they aren't able to get out and run and score in transition, if they're not making their shots at a high level, um, they're going to they're going to give up offensive rebounds. And you've seen Robert Williams absolutely dominate this series. And the fact that he has remained healthy has been huge for the Celtics. He had eight points, 10 boards, four blocks, three steals, which sounds robust, but his impact was seen and felt well beyond what those numbers indicate. The number of shots he altered at the rim in the paint um, he has been an absolute monster for them. And I don't know what the answer is because it's not Kevon Looney, it's not Draymond Green, and there's no other bench pieces with size on that Warriors bench waiting to come in. Um, and then now with Steph Hurt with that foot injury, really feels like the Warriors are on the ropes. The Celtics four-point favorites on Friday uh, with the total set at 214.5. The series odds, Celtics now overwhelming favorites at minus 225 with the Warriors at plus 185. You don't want to overreact to one game, but given what we've seen over the course of three games now, I mean, it's just been the third quarters that have that have doomed the Celtics, as was you know is the case commonly with the Warriors. They're known for their third quarter, third quarter dominance, but the Celtics have been the better team. They've got significant edges, like I mentioned, in the paint. Their perimeter defense has been very good, um, and if Steph again anywhere, you know, significantly less than one hundred percent. He is going to be, um, can't imagine he's going to be himself, which means the Warriors are in big trouble because he's been carrying them. Draymond Green was absolutely woeful on Wednesday night with just two points. He also fouled out in that game. Let's get to our guest. I want to bring Nick Dayus in, the host and founder of Blue Wire's Veterans Minimum Podcast. Uh, follow him on Twitter at Nick Dayus 10 Nick, I see you've got the Rangers uh, sweater on. We're going to talk NBA, but first, a uh, little bit of hockey. Game five. On Thursday evening between the Rangers and Lightning, is this uh, is your city going nuts right now over what the Rangers have been doing? Yeah, Joe, what's going on, man? Good to be back on with you. Uh, yeah, the the Rangers, the city gets behind them, uh, and it's weird because like Dolan owns the Rangers and the Knicks, and the Knicks have been just a dumpster fire for the last twenty plus years, with the exception of like maybe three seasons. But the Rangers have consistently been a pretty 
good team. You know, like early in the 2010s, they made a Stanley Cup finals run, Easter Conference finals. But uh, everyone's behind the ranges, dude. Look, I'm not afraid to admit it, Joe. Uh, I, I jump on the bandwagon when the going gets good. I used to be super into hockey. My buddy Dylan actually gifted me this. It's, uh, it says lamb on the back. Number 10, my favorite number. And I get behind it when the going gets good, dude. Just like baseball to me. Because it's just too much for me to take in, Joe. I kind of pick the sports that I really, really like. But uh, it, it's been fun. It's, it's expensive to get into the garden, though. That's for sure. Yeah, what is the get-in price? I'm curious. I'm on a couple of different secondary markets right now. The cheapest ticket, if you want to sit by yourself, is about $600 to get in. <laughs> oh. And you're talking about like you're up at the rafters with the 94 banner, a couple of retired jerseys kind of thing, Joe. Knicks are more a more popular ticket in town. Like If the Knicks were in the NBA Finals or the Eastern Conference Finals, it would be more than that or less than that? There's not a team in New York City that fans are starving to be good than the Knicks. Got it. Like they, and it, it, cause it's always been, if you look at the landscape of New York sports, Joe, you've had two teams for every sport, but basketball, the Nets, you're still new, right? But Islanders, Rangers, Jets, Giants, Yankees, Mets, there's, there's a, you know, two opposite sides of the spectrum, so to say, but with, with the Knicks, it's always been like, you know, it's the Mecca. It's, it's crazy. If the Knicks ever win an NBA Finals, they're burning MSG to the ground in like the most positive <laughs> analogy you can think of. Uh, let's talk about game three of the finals. The Celtics win 116-100. Uh, the, it's hard to believe and it's easy to forget that the Warriors had a two-point lead in the second half. It evaporated quickly and the Celtics never looked back. What are your takeaways of, of what's happened in the series so far? I haven't talked to you uh, in a couple of weeks now, but but particularly what happened on Wednesday night with the Celtics handling the Warriors by 16. Man, I feel so bad for Steph because I feel like he's playing with this narrative, Joe, and I don't know how, how you feel about it, but real quick, how do you feel about him needing to win a finals MVP for his legacy? It's absurd. Before I go on my rant. It's absurd. It's absolutely asinine. So that's how I feel about it. I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you, dude. I, I co-sign that 100%. To me, he's one of the four or five most impactful, influential basketball players of all time. I mean, everyone now is shooting threes because of what Golden State was doing in the mid-2010s. Uh, uh, when it comes to this series, I feel bad for him because I feel as if he's the only one that consistently can do something productive for them. Uh, Draymond Green has been hilarious to watch. I mean, this guy is playing... <laughs> Tackle football. He's maybe inspired by the hockey playoffs, but he's doing a lot of weird stuff out there. Yesterday, I think he scored like what? One bucket. Fouled out also. You knew that after game two, the way he was tackling people and all those videos were going out that they were going to have an eye on him. He ends up fouling out too. The play where he dives on the ball and then Jalen Brown is, is holding his shoulder. That's like super unnecessary to me also. But in regards to game three, the game to game narratives and takeaways are so drastic. Like after game two, everyone say, well, the, you know, this is the Warriors. They just slipped up game one. They're going to win the finals. Now it's after game three, it's like, well, it's Boston. I think Boston is so versatile in the switching, like their matchups, they're exploiting all the matchups for as great as Steph Curry is offensively. Defensively, he is a liability. They are. Matchup hunting him all the time. And he went on that run in the third quarter, which, Joe, I think the, the Warriors have covered all but one third quarter spread in these playoffs. They've always been known for the third quarter. They just come out the gates and go on these crazy runs. And that's what happened yesterday, too. But I just think it's too much consistent scoring and knowing what you're going to get out of all the players on the Celtics, where Clay was a ghost the first two games. And then game three, he had a nice game. But it's just, it's not as reliable as it once was for Golden State. Yeah, I think what's really notable is I would say that Golden State is probably the deeper team. I think they could legitimately go 10 deep if they wanted to, where the Celtics could not. But the Celtics are a more top-heavy team. They've got more star power, which is really weird to say for a team playing Golden State, who notoriously has had more stars than anybody. 
But you look at, I asked Jonathan Von Tobel this on Monday from VEASAN, and I said, I would love for you to rank the top five players. And without question, you go Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Marcus Smart in the top five, and all three were tremendous on Wednesday night. And you could argue an Al Horford is in the five spot if you want to take him over and Andrew Wiggins. And, and so I think that's really important when watching this series that it makes them really tough to defend because there are so many guys that can beat you. Um, one of the storylines after the game, Draymond Green's wife called out Celtics fans on Twitter for the uh, the FU Draymond chance. I'm, I'm curious what your take on that was. I, I saw a bunch of different reactions, some in agreement, some saying you reap what you sow. Which side of the fence are you on? I mean, Joe, duh is my reaction. They're playing in Boston, dude. Boston is notoriously known for not being so polite to the opposing crowd and sometimes even their own their own uh, teams. Look, Boston is a very hostile place. There's been many stories in the past of whether it's, you know, derogatory terms or racial slurs being thrown at these athletes. And, you know, the F you Draymond, I get it. You're in the crowd too, probably watching it. You don't want to hear them talking like that about like your husband. But in the other day, it's Boston too. It was a Wednesday night. I'm sure everyone was hammered by halftime. And he's the villain in this series. He's the guy who, he loves that. He wants to be the bad guy. And this is kind of what you asked for. Yeah, I agree. In the finals, I think there are different rules. There's different rules for players, and I think there's different rules for fans. And you could argue it's borderline crossing the line, but it ain't that far. It's nowhere near a racial slur. Talking about someone's family. Those are unequivocal, absolute, never in terms of fan conduct. But when you're Draymond Green and the way you have carried yourself in press conferences, on the floor, calling Grant Williams a bozo, basically trying to bait him an entire game in game two, mm -hmm. uh, talking his talk and saying, I would regret it. And I would, I would never forgive myself. I didn't bring that edge to the finals and we ended up losing and not getting another ring. That's okay. But when you embrace the role of villain, as you said, you have to expect to be villainized by the opposing crowd. And I'm all for like, okay, you know, don't swear. In, my, my children are here and don't swear in front of the kids. Well, he said he played like shit in front of with his son sitting right next to him in his post-game presser. So I think we can spare me that argument as well. I, I have no issue with it. Again, you've mentioned that Celtics fans or Boston fans have crossed the line many times before. I don't think this was an instance to me. It, it was uh, the emotion of a heated final series that, that I don't have a, a problem with. Uh, I want to ask you about Joe, Robert. Real, real, yeah, real quick. Please. I want to I just mention one thing. You're talking to someone who one of my favorite sporting events of all time is the Malice at the Palace. <laughs> I think that is something where it's one of my favorite things. I've watched all the documentaries because... Sometimes fans get a little too comfortable. You can't say some of the things that people say to these athletes and expect nothing to happen. Now, look, the F you Draymond, to me, like, if I was an athlete or, or hearing that, like, I, I don't think that's too bad. That's like heat of the moment. You suck. Or, you know, the thing that my friends and I say, like, when a guy's at the free throw line, he misses a free throw. It's like, oh, he's with us. Like, that guy's missing. He's with us. He's on our team. He has our jersey underneath. You know, like trolling them like that is cool. But you're right. Like you cross the line when you start talking about people's families and wives and girlfriends or maybe even religion. You've seen that happen a lot in the MMA world where like religion get brought into it. That is like, all right, man, chill. But also there are some fans that cross the line because they feel like there's no repercussion, right? Yeah. You feel like you could go in there and, well, I'm a fan. You hit me, I'm going to sue you. I don't think it should go like that. I think if, if, if fans knew for a fact that Draymond Green could go and like slap someone if they said something crazy like that, I guarantee you the fans don't talk like that. Yeah. No, I agree. I think it's it's 2022. I think we've gotten to the point where the F word is is not as taboo anywhere close right. than what it's yeah, like you mentioned, it's much more on par with hey, you suck. And I, I think that's Celtics fans are within their right given the role Draymond has in this series that he's put on himself. Um I have to ask you about Robert Williams because he puts up Eight points, 10 boards, four blocks, three steals, a very robust stat line, but he was even more impressive than what those stats show. Um, I talked about it at the top of the show. We saw the Warriors in the regular season struggle with teams with a standout front court. And the, Robert Williams gave it to him on Wednesday night. They had no answer for him. 
The Celtics had 16 offensive rebounds as a team. Um, is he sort of Boston's X factor that that is going to dominate this series without an answer? What's the counterpunch the Warriors could possibly throw at him? Well, the size for Boston was something that a lot of people were intrigued by. And Robert Williams, his knee was the big storyline I felt like coming in because, yo, not only the blocks, how many shots does he alter at the bucket? Tons. Right? Like, guy has so many that don't appear on the stat sheet. He's a prime example of a guy who does so much more than what the box score shows. And that's what I took for, from Williams. He's such a presence for them. Alter shots. And, you know, the, for as good as that fast five lineup that they have that they like to call or, or, or the death lineup 2.0, Draymond is your center and he's six seven. And yeah, he plays bigger than his, what he is. He's got a seven foot wingspan and all that. Yeah. But he yeah, ain't Robert Williams. It's cool. Exactly. That's sometimes it really just comes down to that. And I think he allows Horford to venture out, stretch the floor, opens things up for the other guys too. So he's been a big X factor, man. Just his presence alone. And you saw it in, in the series when he came back against Milwaukee for a little bit. You see the impact that he has when he's on the floor for them and then when he's not. Yeah. I want to ask you about Jordan Poole on the Warriors side because to me, he is the Dubs X factor in wild card. And we saw him show up for game two. The Warriors went easily. And he's been mostly a no show. You talk about, a, you know, Steph being a defensive liability, Jordan Poole, much more so um, because he lacks the, the veteran savvy to at least be in the right spots. Um, even, you know, so he's across the board, a defensive liability. Uh, how much more do they need to get from him for them to have a chance, especially now that Steph Curry has that foot injury and and his status is is unknown moving forward. Even if he plays, he won't be 100%. Yeah, Joe, and it's interesting that the schedule now changes just a little bit where between game one and two, you had three days off and then between three, game two and three, you had three days off. Well, now they're playing on Friday. So that's that's something to monitor where you didn't have that layout early on in the series. As far as Jordan Poole goes, I fully expected that kind of performance yesterday because that's that's a NBA Finals game in Boston. So for as much as we think these athletes are indestructible, you're going on the road, your first NBA Finals road game for Jordan Poole. I think it was more of a jitter thing for him. He has answered the bell many times in the past, but I think that was just growing pains for a young player. Like you saw Steph and Clay, they didn't care at all in that third quarter. They were going nuclear. But for everyone else, those other young guys, you know, like Gary Payton, he was, he played 11 minutes. He was unplayable yesterday too. And he's like a defensive stopper for them. So to me, I think it was just the growing pains of a young guy. But Joe, you're spot on, dude. If, if Jordan Poole can't give you that, that burst off the bench, that X factor that he was supposed to be to carry your second unit when Curry steps out for a little bit or with Clay, I think it's fair to say is kind of an unknown now. It's, it's basically a coin flip what you're going to get out of Clay. It's it's going to be big. And if he doesn't come back to play in game four, this this might be ending in five. Yeah. Do you think the Warriors are cooked? I mean, that, you kind of alluded to it. I mean, or do you see some value give, in plus 185 at the series line? No, nah, man. I think, I think it's too much for Golden State. It's too much uncertainty for Golden State, I would say, where you kind of know what to expect from Boston. And, you know, in game one, Joe, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, you're not going to be able to get 15 threes from Derek White and Williams and Marcus Smart and Horford. It's like, yeah, that, that's a fair assessment. Draymond Green alluded to that too, but it's also, you're not going to get 12 points out of Tatum. So there's a regression to the mean in that, in my opinion. And that's what you've seen in game two and then in game three. But I think with, with the Curry ankle, a report came out that it feels like it did when he got hurt in the regular season, ironically enough, against Boston. Same pains, and then dude ended up missing time too. I think now he's going to suck it up because it's the finals. I think Boston is not going to lose at home. My my buddy Nick on, on the show that we did, he said that Boston's going to take care of business all at home. So after they split those first two games, it's kind of looking like that. So I don't think it goes seven. I would bet money that it doesn't go seven, but I think it could end back in five depending on how Boston wants to do. Boston does also lay eggs too, right? We've seen them look so good and then they come back and they have one of those awful performances. So I'm fascinated by game four for many, many reasons. Nick, let's turn the page to UFC 275 on Saturday night, the main event, Yuri against Teixeira. Yuri 
Uh, the non-champion favorite at minus 200 to share at plus 165. I know you love an underdog champion. Uh, we've talked about this a couple times as we've looked in the horizon of what's ahead. Now this fight is here. Have your thoughts changed at all um, on this fight now that we're you know 48 hours away? Nah, man. And you're right. This is a spot, Joe, where historically I kind of just blindly bet the underdog champion. The numbers in the last 26 fights... 21 and five is the underdog champion. And there were two fights that were ruled no contest because it was John Jones at the time with Daniel Cormier. So there's a significant trend backing the underdog champion. And in this fight in particular, Joe, it's fascinating because Yuri has fought two times in the UFC. He was this big prospect overseas, comes over, gets two finishes of two guys that fought for championships. All right. Fear once fought DC and Boston. He lost the, the title shot to uh, Daniel Cormier. And then Yuri knocked out uh, Dominic Reyes in, in like just cringy, in a cringy way. Like cringy, like, oh my God, I think he killed him with this crazy elbow. So Yuri is a dominant striker, very, uh, very highlight real kind of finisher. Glover is your grizzled vet. He's over 40 years old. He's going on this crazy run now where he's won seven or eight straight fights. He's the champion now too. And Glover is probably better everywhere but the stand-up. And the popular pick is Glover by submission at plus 400 because no one has seen Yuri on the ground. No one has seen his grappling. And I think that's what it's going to come down to. It's your classic submission grappler versus your striker. And I love, I love the plus 165 on Glover. I think this is a lot. You see this happen often in the UFC, Joe, where you get a lot of momentum, these highlight reel finishes, and then a guy is steamrolled to the top. And I think there's a lot of value on the underdog champion here, Joe. You mentioned this is a classic grappler versus striker type matchup. In these matchups, does that sort of favor either side, whether it's the grappler or the striker, or is it totally a fight-by-fight -fight basis? It, <laughs> yes or no. And I hate kind of giving those answers, but it all depends how each fighter dictates it, right? Like sometimes when you have, the ego gets in the way and pride gets in the way and you're a striker, it's like, all right, I'm going to try and grapple with this guy to, to prove that I'm the better MMA uh, fighter or the other way around. Well, I'm the knockout guy. I want to I wanna wrestle him and show him that I could beat him at his own game. That's something that we'll get to in just a little bit that another fighter does that's on this card. But here it's a it's a fight by fight basis. I always like leaning towards the wrestler submission guy because it's a completely different world when it hits the ground. And also when you're the wrestler, you dictate where the fight goes. Up against the cage, on the mats, you're in so many more dominant positions. Uh Glover is a 42 year old first time champion. Is veteran savvy? Is that a real thing in MMA? And is that something that could potentially work in his favor against an up-and-coming finisher? Oh, absolutely, Joe. W without a doubt. Uh, this guy's been in the game for a long, long time. And Glover is the grizzled vet who has gotten better with age. And the thing with him is the only concern I have, and I hate this across the board for all fighters, it started happening with me with Ronda Rousey when before her home fight, she started talking about Hollywood and started talking about starting a family and started talking about all these other things that she was being pulled in so many different directions. When you start to check out a little bit as a fighter, it's like, mm, that's a little bit of a red flag for me. Reason why I say that is Glover has said that he doesn't see many more fights on the horizon for him. Obviously, he's 42, but there's also some rumblings that he might walk away after this fight if he does get the win. So to me, I don't like it when you're half in, half out, Joe. That's kind of like my thing with these kind of fights. Uh, I'm curious, how does the the light heavyweight class compare to others? I mean, we're asking you, how big is this fight? I, I guess, where does this class go from here? To, where does this class rank in the power rankings of other weight classes in UFC? Dude, what a phenomenal question, man. And the reason why I say that is yes. for about, yes. for about yes. 10, 15 years, this was ran by two guys. It was ran by John Jones and Daniel Cormier. And when John Jones was doing the weird stuff he was doing outside of the octagon and they'd strip him of the title, DC was dominating everyone. Daniel Cormier's only lost to John Jones, one of them a no contest because of uh, being popped for PEDs, and then the other one was Stipe. 
So DC is arguably the best lightweight of all time too. It's just that John Jones is probably the greatest UFC fighter of all time. His only loss was a, a fight in which he had two 10-8 rounds on the guy. And back then, Joe, you couldn't throw the 10 the 12 six elbow. Remember those like viral, early viral videos of the guys breaking like nine sheets of ice with their elbows and cinder blocks? That was, it's an illegal strike. So that's the only reason why John Jones has one loss on his record. But the star power, this used to be the star power of the UFC because you had John Jones, you had Daniel Cormier. This was the top draw. And then over time, now it's, now it's, well, who, who is the champion? It was, it was Jan Blockowitz and it was like, you know, there's always, there's always a little bit of a loophole you have to dive through when you have international champions, especially ones where their English isn't their first language, right? That's why a lot of people in the beginning didn't like Habib. And then when Habib started opening up and, and being so funny on the mic and showing his personality, he became a top draw. So what you have here with Glover and Yeri is there's not much in the 205 division. Uh, Luke Rockhold was a 185er. He was a champion. He was a big name. He's in the 205 now. Paulo Costa in the 205. They're trying to get some star power in the 205 because ever since John Jones and DC left it, Joe, it's been kind of a, all right, it's a title fight, but it's not, holy shit, it's a title fight. Got you. Uh, last pay-per-view, we had a snoozer of a co-main. Uh, this time around, we've got Shevchenko at minus 625 against Santos at plus 450 for the women's flyweight title. Uh, Shevchenko, the big storyline here, trying to break Ronda Rousey's record with a seventh straight title defense. Uh, she is a huge favorite. She's made it look easy to this point. Is this going to be a no contest fight or does Santos have any fighters, punchers chance uh, of a hope here in this one? Joe, Santos is a very, very good and dangerous opponent. This is probably the best opponent that I believe can beat Valentina. Now, I don't think it's going to happen, but if you had to ask me of all the prior opponents for Valentina, this is probably the most dangerous one. I'm probably going to bet Tyla Santos just because I don't think she should be a plus 450 underdog, but fully expecting to donate, if that makes sense. And a lot of times, my friends will be like, why are you going to do such a thing? Well, in MMA, if there's a miscorrect pricing on a, on a line, I'm going to bet that. I remember Dustin Poirier was a three to one underdog to Connor. I was like, that it should be closer to a pick him. And then he ends up stopping him in that second fight in, in Fight Island. So with this one, Tyla Santos is very dangerous. I think she definitely has a chance. Before I mentioned a fighter on the card who kind of likes to beat people at their own game, it's Valentina Shevchenko. If you're a grappler, she's going to out grapple you. If you're a kickboxer, that's her bread and butter. So you're not going to out-kickbox her. Valentina seems to cruise in a lot of her fights. And I do think eventually, Joe, it might come back to bite her. I don't think it's going to happen here. But I think with Valentina, she's entered this territory where it's not how she's going to win. It's, it's not if she's going to win. Excuse me. It's how she's going to win. Yep. And that's why you see as a minus 600 favorite, minus 620. Her to win on points is plus 100. If you look at the rounds, it's favored for it to go over the three and a half rounds. So I would probably bet Valentina to win on points via decision at plus 100 as opposed to minus 625. That's also because, Joe, I'm never laying minus five, 600 on a favorite in UFC because there's just no value to it. And it's just, to me, it's, it's a dumb bet to make. One of your favorite, if not maybe your favorite fight on the card, I know, is a rematch of the best woman's fight ever in your book. Mm. And that's, uh, I might butcher this, but Wiley Zhang uh, and JJ. Wiley is a minus 175 favorite with JJ at plus 145. Oh, yeah, dude. I was actually lucky enough to be there. It was uh, the weekend before my birthday in 2020, before the world turned out of control with the pandemic. I was in Vegas for this fight and it was dope. It was really dope. and. This is the greatest, it's one of the greatest fights of all time, Joe, but easily the best woman's fight of all time. I recently rewatched it. It's something I tend to do whenever there's a rematch of this kind of magnitude too, like a, you know, high up on the card kind of fight. There was a lot of controversy, Joe, as to, because it was a split decision. And to me, the more I watched it, Zhang won that four rounds to one. And in this fight in particular, I think Zhang at minus 175 is a gift. 
she is the better fighter. She's the more powerful fighter. She's the one that has a chance to get a finish in this fight. Though Joanna has been very durable outside of her one loss to Rose Namajunas where she got knocked out. Joe, we haven't seen Joanna since that fight. We're going on like two years and three months since. And Wei Li's been active. So to me, that's something that I look for. And the over is two and a half rounds at minus 275. I think Wei Li to win on points at plus 150 is how I would bet this. But Wei Li at minus 175, I think could be a core of a parlay piece for you. That was a five-round fight, Joe, back two years ago. Now this is a three-round fight. And Wei Li is the better athlete. She's the better striker. She's more powerful. I think that bodes well for her as opposed to Joanna. He is Nick Dayus, the host and founder of Blue Wire's Veterans Minimum Podcast. Follow him on Twitter at Nick Dayus10. Uh, Nick, it's always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Enjoy the fights on Saturday, and we'll catch up soon. Joe, anytime. Good stuff there, as always, with my guy Nick. Love chatting with him. And again, a really fun card this weekend. He gave you, hopefully, a couple of winners uh, to, put, to punch some tickets, cash some tickets this weekend. I will do so in a winning pick shortly. But we've got a promo with DJ Diesel. You can party with Shaq Diesel. All users can bet $100 on the NBA or in the casino and be entered into a prize drawing to attend a DJ Diesel performance at Encore Beach Club uh, sometime over the course of the summer uh, here at The Win. You can also win a meet and greet with Shaq himself. Go to winbet.com or download the WinBet app for official rules and details. Winning pick time. I'm 2-0 and so far in June, up almost two full units. I'm going with a plus money play going to the ice with the Eastern Conference Finals. I'm taking the Rangers money line. Nick was rocking that Rangers jersey, that Rangers sweater, I should say, get the lingo right. But I'm taking the Rangers money line at plus 110 against the Lightning. The home team has won all four games so far in this series. The series is tied at two. Um, and you look at what's happened. The Rangers dominated at home in games one and two, and they were up 2-0 in game three with a chance to put a stranglehold on this series. The Lightning come back, win that game. They also win game four. But now being road favorites doesn't sit well with me. Give me the plus money in a game that there's no reason why the Rangers couldn't or even shouldn't win. Um, so, yeah, I'm taking the Rangers plus 110 on the money line. Um, a home dog in the playoffs. Uh, sign me up for that. The winner will obviously have the opportunity to lose to the Avalanche in the Stanley Cup Finals because they're a wagon. Uh, they've already there because they punched their ticket by beating the Oilers. Again, Rangers Lightning tonight, plus 110, the Rangers money line. Give me the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. That's going to do it for this week's shows. We'll see you on the other side of this weekend, recapping uh, the NBA Finals. Much to come there in that series. Can the Warriors bounce back? And at that point, we will potentially have a Stanley Cup final matchup. So we'll see you on the other side of this weekend, right here on Bet to Win.